they were not really all that interested to go down to Egypt because they would be reminded of their unhappy memories of watching their father grieve over the son that they had sold into slavery and whom he now thinks is dead. So you can understand their hesitation, but they had to keep up the facade of some semblance of normality. And then he said, verse 2, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy for us from thence, that we may live and not die. And Joseph's ten brethren went to buy corn in Egypt. It was their only hope, because the famine was also in the land of Canaan, not just in the land of Egypt. Verse 3, well, f verse 4, pardon me. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob sent not with his brethren, for he said, lest peradventure mischief befall him. Little does he realize that a lot of mischief is going to befall all of his sons, including Benjamin, at the hands of his other son, Joseph. The sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. Now think about what was happening here. They come to the city. They are guided by friends, or, or rather uh, people, common people, to go to the place where they can buy corn. It is a large building. And it is a long haul, perhaps. And there are big pillars, you know, the um, Egyptian-style pillars. Joseph is at one end of the building, and all along the way are little booths where his servants would sell corn to the Egyptians. But the foreigners, Joseph handled himself, because Joseph needed to be very careful about foreign invasion and foreign spies and foreign, foreign people because they were, you know, you don't know who they are. So when they came into the building, this majestic building, they are directed to the table where Joseph is sitting. Or perhaps it's more elegant. It's more of a table of state. It's not some simple table. This is, this is the official place where they negotiate international relations at this point in time. The man sitting there is unknown to Joseph's brothers. They don't realize who he is. And they come to him, and the, since he is wearing his regal and royal coat, remember, Joseph was given a coat. It says vestments in chapter 41. We are told in verse 42 that Pharaoh gave him his ring and vestures of fine linen. In other words, they gave him the royal treatment, the royal coat of authority and stature and, uh, and it was to him that Joseph would go for, or that the people would go for anything that they needed. So when they came to this place, and Joseph is sitting there with his Egyptian headdress and, and his royal coat with a ring, the king's ring on his finger, they bow low before him because they know that he is the one that is in authority. Verse 7, Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them. Can you imagine the emotions and the feelings that swept over Joseph as he saw his brothers bowing to the earth before him? No doubt the memory of his dreams came back to his mind, and suddenly he realized that he was now seeing the fulfillment of the very dreams that God had given him. 
And it says, Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. After all, he disguised himself. He looked like an Egyptian, really. Maybe a little different skin color, but basically he looked like an Egyptian. And he spoke to them in the Egyptian tongue. Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them and said unto, him, unto them, he, he realized that he couldn't just treat them as his brothers, not right, quite yet. He, he was impressed, no doubt, by the Spirit of God to test them to understand how they were now. Have they changed or are they still the same vicious, um, uh, <clears throat> retaliatory brethren that he once knew? <clears throat> So he decided to accuse them as spies. You are spies to see the nakedness of the land ye are come. And they said unto him, No, no, my lord, but to buy food are thy servants come. We are all one man's sons. We are true men. Thy servants are no spies. And he said unto them, Nay, but you see the nakedness of the land you are come. And they said, Thy servants are twelve brethren, the sons of one man of in the land of Canaan, and behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and the one is not. Now imagine Joseph thinking about what they're saying. One is not. This is the first time that he realizes that his brothers think that he is dead. They think that something has happened to him and he's no longer alive and that he, well, he's just not any longer. And they don't say what they think happened to him. They don't tell him what happened to him. They don't explain what they did to their brother Joseph, to Joseph. <laughs> he already knows anyway, but they don't know that. And Joseph said unto them, that is it that I spake unto you, saying, you are spies. You know, this accusation of spying was a very easy one for Joseph to come up with because that was a big concern. How much food does Egypt actually have? You know, and to ascertain that, some spies would have to come to the land and try and sort that all out. So he had to be very careful about spies. Then he says, hereby ye shall be proved. Here's my solution. By the life of Pharaoh, ye shall not go forth hence, except your youngest brother come thither, or hither. Send one of you, and let him fetch your brother, and ye shall be kept in prison, that your words may be proved, whether there be any truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh, you, shall sh you surely are spies. So then he put them all together in the prison. And he left them there for three days. They can be thinking about, about their, their past, you know. And on the third day, Joseph said unto them, This do and live, for I fear God. You know, you have families at home. You have to look after your families. But by putting them in there for three days, they could think about themselves, and he could think about what he's going to do next. Because all of this came up spontaneously. He had not planned this. He had to think and pray to God and ask God for wisdom, know how to deal with his brothers. So in verse 19, he said, If you be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye, carry corn for your, the famine of your home, houses, and bring your youngest brother unto me, so shall your words be verified, and ye shall not die. So they did so. And they said one to another, we are very guilty concerning our brother, meaning Joseph, in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress is come upon us. They realize that the sins of their youth have come back now to haunt them. And I don't know about you, but the sins of my youth have come back to haunt me. <laughs> It's amazing, you know. We have to let God sort them out. Otherwise, unless we realize that God has to get rid of them, we, have, we, we will wallow in them the rest of our lives. God will 
put us through experiences that will help us humble ourselves so that we can let go of the things that we have done in the past. And sometimes the very people that we have offended come back around and offend us. I tell you, that's a very interesting experience. When you have, as you grow up, you learn things and you do things and then you have to eventually uh, face the same problem or similar problem as to what you created for others. Um, and these men, I want you to notice verse 21, it says that they were they felt very guilty. Now, keep in mind that these men have for 20 years felt guilty over their father's grief. They have watched their father grieve for 20 years over the loss of Joseph. And they realized that they were the ones who were responsible for it. Can you imagine this conspiracy against Jacob? They were all in it together and nobody broke rank. Over 20 years, nobody told their father the truth about what really happened. Imagine the guilt that they must have felt, the weight of guilt that came upon them. But God was about to get it all out and resolve this issue, this problem. God is wonderful. God wants to resolve any guilt, any issues, any problems that you have had in your life, he wants to resolve them and bring reconciliation. They saw the anguish of his soul. That when Joseph was taken out of the pit <coughs> and they were selling him to, this, to the Ishmaelites, no doubt Joseph pled with them with tears. In fact, later on, you'll, you can read this, that he, he wept bitterly with them that they not sell him to the Egyptian or to the Ishmaelites. Um, but they said, We refuse to hear. Their hearts were hardened against their brother. This is their church member, their fellow church member. Have you ever had someone mistreat you as a church member? Has anyone ever stabbed you in the back? Has anyone ever accused you falsely or even truthfully? And you reacted against it? Many things happen, not only in the church, but in other places as well. But it's especially in the church that God has to deal with these problems, to deal with the guilt, to deal with the sin, to deal with the offense. Verse 22, <laughs> Reuben, <laughs> Reuben answered them saying, did I not speak unto you saying, do not sin against the child and ye would not hear? Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. And they knew not that Joseph understood them, <laughs> for he spake unto them by an interpreter. Joseph listened to their conversation, even as he was telling them that they were going to be in, uh, to choose one of them and, and the rest of them go home. And they had this conversation right in front of Joseph. Verse 24, and he turned himself about from them and wept. And returned to them and took from them Simeon and bound him before their eyes. Now, why did he choose Simeon? The reason he chose Simeon was because Simeon was, one of the, was the one who was the meanest and the most vicious of all of his brothers. Yes, Judah was a traitor. Judah was the one who sold him and made the idea to, to sell and make some profit off of Joseph. But it was Simeon who was the meanest and the most unkind to Joseph. So he took Simeon and put Simeon in prison. Not because he wanted revenge. Joseph wasn't that kind of man. But he wanted to test and see if Simeon was the kind of man that God wanted him to be. If he was the same as before or if he had been converted, if he had changed. Verse 25, then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn and to restore every man's money unto his sack and to give them provision for the way. Thus did he unto them. And they laded their asses with the corn and departed thence. 
And as one of them opened his sack to give his ass provender in the inn, he espied his money. For behold, it was in the mouth of the sack. And he said unto his brethren, My money is restored. And lo, it is even in my sack. Look. And their heart failed them, and they were afraid, saying one to another, What is this that God hath done to us? They saw this as a, an omen of evil that was about to come upon them. They understood that the Egyptians were very shrewd. The Egyptians had a reputation for being able to set up an offense that could be used as an accusation if they wanted to. And here was the perfect opportunity. Verse 29, they came to Jacob their father unto the land of Canaan and told him all that befell unto them, saying, the man who's in the Lord of the land spake roughly to us and took us for spies of the country. And he said, uh, we said unto him, we are true men, we are no spies. We be twelve brethren, sons of our father. One is not, <laughs> Joseph, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. And the man, the Lord of the country, said unto us, hereby shall I know that ye are true men. Leave one of your brethren here with me, Simeon, and take food for the famine of your households and, and be gone. And bring your youngest brother unto me, then shall I know that ye are no spies, but ye are true men, so will I deliver you to your father, uh, to your brother, and he shall traffic, and ye shall traffic in the land. You'll do business in the land. So it came to pass, they emptied their sacks, that behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack, and when he and when both they and their father saw the bundles of money. They were afraid. You can imagine how they felt. They went and bought this stuff, and then all the money's in their sack. It's as if they stole it back. In other words, the Egyptians could easily accuse them of some shrewd behavior whereby they had uh, stolen the food by this seeming transaction. And Jacob, their father, said unto them, verse 36, me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, Simeon is not, and ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. And Reuben spake unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons, if I bring him not to thee. Now think about what Reuben just said. Reuben is giving a very rash statement. He is saying, Kill my two sons if I don't bring Benjamin back to you. That, that's... That, is, that did not impress Jacob. And um, Jacob simply said in verse 38, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way in which ye go, then shall ye bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. So, so Joseph, <laughs> Joseph has really put his brothers in a difficult spot. The strong appeal to them is to confess their sin and get it out of their lives. But they're still holding on to it. And even a year later, after they have eaten up all the food, they're still in Canaan, and now the food is all eaten up, and now they, they, they're forced to go back to the land of Egypt. It says in verse 1 of chapter 43, the Famine was sore in the land, and it came to pass when they had eaten up the corn that they had bought it out of Egypt, their father said unto them, Go again, buy us a little food. And Judah spake unto him, saying, The man did solemnly protest unto us, saying, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. Simeon's still in prison down there in Egypt. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said unto us, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. And Israel said, Wherefore dealt ye so ill with me? You can hear the anguish of his soul as to tell the man whether you had a brother. And they said, The man asked us straightly of our state and of our kindred, saying, Is your father yet alive? You can imagine Joseph. He wants to know if his father is still alive. And so he quizzes his brothers, not knowing, of course, who, that, that, that he was Joseph. 
And they don't realize that he's asking about his own father. Oh, he would love to see his father again, but he can't, not yet. And we told him, according to the tenor of these words, could we certainly know that he would say, bring your brother down? And Judah said unto Israel, Jacob his father, send the lad with me. And we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and thou and all our little ones. I will be surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require him, if I bring him not unto thee, and, let him before, and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. And except we had lingered, surely now we would have returned this second time. And their father Israel said unto him, If it must be so now, do this. Take the best fruits of the land in your vessels and carry down to the man a present, a little balm, a little honey, spices and myrrh, nuts and almonds. And take double money in your hand and the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sacks. Carry it again in your hand, peradventure it was an oversight. Also take your brother, arise and go again unto the man, and God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may send away your other brother ben and Benjamin, and if I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. What a powerful expression of sorrow and resignation to the will of God in the life of Jacob. Imagine giving up his second beloved son of his beloved wife, never realizing whether or not he's going to come back again. In fact, very concerned that he won't come back again. So, Joseph uh, was in Egypt, and the men took that present. They, Verse 15, they took double money in their hand and Benjamin and rose up and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. Now you can imagine, here they come into the hallway again. <laughs> and Joseph is sitting down there at the end. And these brethren come in this time. He spies an extra, well, the same amount as came before because he has one in prison. And now he realizes he, that his younger brother Benjamin is there with him, with them. And he saw Benjamin with them, and he said to the ruler of his house, Bring these men home, and slay and make ready. For these men shall dine with me at noon. And the man did as Joseph bade, and the man brought the men to that Joseph's house. The men were afraid because they were brought unto Joseph's house, and they said, because of the money that was turned in our sacks at the first time we are brought in, that we, he may seek occasion against us and fall upon us and take us our, as bondmen and our asses. And they came near to the steward of Joseph's house, and they communed with him at the door of the house. This is quite a, a convoluted story, but it's, um, it's very, very significant. As these brothers come into the house of, Jake, of Joseph, they're very troubled. And they come to the steward and they say, Sir, we indeed came down at the first time to buy food. And it has come to pass when we came to the inn that we opened our sacks. And behold, every man's money was in the mouth of his sack. Our money in full weight. And we have brought it again in our hand. The other money we have brought down in our hands to buy food. We cannot tell who put money in our hand, uh, in our sacks, rather. And then verse 23, he simply says, Peace be to you. Fear not, your God, now notice, your God, and the God of your father, this is an Egyptian who now understands the God of Joseph. He hath given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. And he brought Simeon out unto them. He's getting everything ready. So they made ready the present for Joseph. When Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand. 
And they bowed themselves to the earth. Now this is the second time they bowed themselves to Joseph. They fulfilled his promise the second time. The third time uh, is in verse 28. Um, first, Joseph asked them, is your father well? You, this is the great burden of his heart. Is his father well? Of whom ye spake? Is he yet alive? They answered, they, thy servant, thy father, our father is in good health. He is yet alive. And they bowed down their heads and made obeisance. That's the third time. How many times did they bow down to Joseph? Well, they even bowed down one more time later on in the story. And he lifted his eyes and he saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom ye spake unto me? And he said, God be gracious to thee, my son. Now notice the next verse. This one says, Joseph made haste, for his bowels did yearn upon his brother, and he sought where to weep. And he entered into his chamber, and he wept there. And then he washed his face and came out, refrained himself, and they set on bread. And the Bible tells us that, that uh, Benjamin had the largest portion of food, and that all of them were sitting according to their ages in, around the table. And they, ama they were amazed at this. Then, of course, he commanded the steward to fill all the sacks, and eventually they went on their way. But Joseph instructed his steward to chase after them and to accuse them of taking his divining cup, which he had instructed him to put into Benjamin's sack. This play, this, Joseph had learned how to, how to think like an Egyptian and how to set up a way of ac accusing. And, of course, he was, wasn't doing it as a revenge. He was doing it because he wanted to understand his brothers. <coughs> so the, 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 the steward chases after his brothers and accuses them. And, of course, they say in verse 9 of chapter 44, verse 9 of chapter 44, With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, let him die, and we also will be my Lord's bondmen. And so he said, now let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my servant, and ye shall be blameless. Only with the one who is the, the guilty party. They speedily took down their sacks to the ground and opened every man his sack. Verse 11. Then they speedily took down, whoops, verse 12, pardon me. And he searched and began the, with the eldest and left at the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. So he started with Reuben, and he ended with Benjamin. How did he know who these brothers were? How did he know what their ages were? How did he know which was the oldest and which was the youngest? Well, he might have been able to figure out the youngest, but he certainly didn't know who the, the exact ages of all these brethren, unless he'd been told, obviously, by Joseph. And then, of course... They were all shocked, and they all went back to Egypt, or back to the city. And um, then in verse 14, Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there, <laughs> waiting for them, needless to say. And they fell before him on the ground. Now that's the fourth time. The fourth time that they bowed down and worshipped Joseph. And Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that ye have done? Did you not know that such a man as I can certainly divine? And you've taken my cup. And Judah said, now this, is, now this is Judah. Remember who Judah was? Judah was the one who sold Joseph to slavery. Now Judah steps forward. And his speech is utterly ex it's just utterly amazing. He's so humble. He said, what shall I say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out our iniquity. He confesses his sin in front of Joseph. 
God hath found out our iniqui of the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also with whom the cup is found. Benjamin, the very one that Judah had made himself surety for him. And then he... Um, Basically, he said, God forbid that I should do so, but the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. Well, he knew that wasn't going to happen, at least not yet. And then Judah came near unto him and said, O oh, my Lord, let, me, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servants, saying, Have ye a father or a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. And thou saidst to thy servants, Bring him down to me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. And he said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father. For if he should leave his father, his father would die. This is Benjamin's appeal to Joseph. Please be merciful. And thou saidst unto thy servants, Except your youngest brother come down with you, you shall see my face no more. And it came to pass, when we came up unto thy servant, thy, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, Go again and buy us a little food. And we said, We cannot go down if our youngest brother is not with us. Then we will go down if he is, and we will, for the, we may not see the man's face except our youngest brother be with us. But I, I want you to notice verse 28. And it says, The one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces. Oh, hang on. Uh, we better read verse 27. Thy servant, my father, said unto us, You know that my wife bare me two sons. And the one went out from me and said, I, Surely he is torn in pieces, and I saw him not since. And if ye take this also from me, mischief befall him, he shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. And so Judah then makes an appeal. He says, Therefore I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass, when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die. And thy servants shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave. For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father, saying that if I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. For therefore I pray thee, let me... Thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bondman to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. He didn't think about his family. He didn't think about his children. He didn't think about his wife. He only thought of his promise to his father. What has happened to Judah? You see, the 20 years of guilt was weighing heavy on him. The 20 years of hiding behind a facade of deceit was now come back to haunt him, and he realizes that he must now pay for his sin, so to speak. He must now give up his own freedom so that his brother could have the freedom. For how shall I go up to my father and the lad be not with me, he said. I have to stay here and let the lad go. Chapter 45 tells us that Joseph could not refrain himself before all of them that stood by him. And he cried, cause everyone to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known to his brethren. The Bible says he wept aloud and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? Can you imagine Joseph, his brothers, suddenly, what? How is this ruler of Egypt 
our brother whom we sold into slavery. How can this be? Joseph pleads with them, please understand me. I am Joseph. And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. Now he's going to, now they're worried about revenge. Now they understand why they've been going through all this. Now they understand that Joseph has the power to destroy them. But Joseph loves them. Joseph, like Christ, loves his brethren. Christ loved the Jews. Christ gave his life for the Jews. So how could he take revenge? Even though they've turned their backs on him. Even though they have, have, have you know, rejected him. Still, he will save a Jew if he will come to Christ. And the same for us as God's people. If you have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Christ will take you back, even as Joseph took back his brothers. Yes, he'll put you through purification process in order to get you ready for the kingdom of heaven, but he will take you back. No matter how wicked your life has been, no matter how much sin you have in your background, no matter how much sorrow and pain you've caused to other people, Christ still will take you back. You see, Joseph is a type of Christ. And what Joseph went through, Christ went through. What Joseph did for his brothers, Christ will do for you. Joseph said unto his brethren, verse 4, Come near unto me, I pray you. Just as Christ often said the same. And they came near and he said, I am Joseph, your brother. They could hardly believe it. Whom you sold into Egypt. Yes, I'm the one that all those years before, those 22 years or whatever it was before, you sold into slavery. Here I am. I'm now the ruler of Egypt. How did this happen? You know, you can imagine the, the consternation in their minds and the questions and the uncertainties. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve your lives. For though these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Wow. All of a sudden, Joseph explains what he understands to be God's purpose for his own life in sending him to Egypt at the behest of his brethren. He doesn't blame them. And you know, my friends, when you are struck with some injustice, don't blame the person who caused the injustice. That's not the one who really caused it or allowed it. It's the enemy of souls that caused the injustice. He's the one that causes all sin in our lives. But think of it as God's way of purifying your own life, of restoring his grace, his power, his truth in your life once again. Clearing out the, the mess that's inside of us is God's way of getting us ready for the kingdom of heaven. Verse 8. So now it was not you that sent me hither. I don't blame you. It's not you. But God is the one who sent me here. And he hath made me a father unto Pharaoh. And lord of all his house. And ruler throughout the land of all, all the land of Egypt. Haste ye. And go up to my father. And say unto him. Thus saith thy son Joseph. God hath made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me and tarry not. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen. And thou shalt be near unto me. 
thou and thy children, thy children's children, and thy flocks and thy herds, and all that thou hast. Ah, oh. now these brethren have a problem. What is their problem? These brethren now have to go and confess their sin to their father. <laughs> oh boy. You know, unless we confess, we can't be forgiven. So Joseph tells them, come on down to Egypt, go and confess your sin to your father and get it out of your systems and come down and be with me here in Egypt. That's what he's saying to them. Unless we forget, for, confess our sins, he cannot be faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's absolutely necessary that we confess our sins and repent of our sins so that God can forgive us and cleanse us of anything that is wrong in our lives. You can imagine Joseph sending all of the carts and the wagons and all sorts of things to help bring the the goods and chattels of Jacob and his family and his children's children and all his grandchildren, a vast number of people, bring them all down to Egypt. He had to, they had to have some kind of, uh, some kind of trucks <laughs> to bring it all down there, you know? Ancient trucks drawn by mules and asses and donkeys and horses and whatever else. Cows, you know, oxen. Joseph sent it all down there so they have enough to bring back everything with them. Joseph's brothers go down to Jacob. And we read about this in verse 25. They went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father. All right, now they're ready to, to tell their father the truth after 22 years at least. And he, they told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. You mean all these years I've been living under a false impression, under a deception? And they told him all the words of Joseph which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. It must be true. He couldn't hardly believe it, but it must be true. Verse 28, Israel said, It is enough, Joseph. My son is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. Oh, what a relief to poor old Joseph. But what a relief to his brothers. Imagine having to confess this sin that has been living with them. The guilt of it has been with them for 22 years. And here they confess it to their father. And he's overwhelmed. And they're overwhelmed. But they're so free now. They don't, you know, when you are forgiven your sins, you are free. The guilt is gone and it feels so good. You can walk again with a light step. In fact, we're told that God spake unto Israel, verse 2 of chapter 46, in the visions of the night, and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down unto Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. I will go down with thee to Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again, and Joseph shall put his hand upon your eyes. In other words, you're going to die in Egypt. But I will bring you up, and you'll be buried in the land of Canaan. And Jacob rose up from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried Jacob, their father, and their little ones, and their wives in their wagons, which... Pharaoh had sent to carry him. And it tells the story of the great journey. And when Joseph knew that his father was now come to Egypt, um, he brought him to the land of Goshen. They lived there for many years till his father died. 
And then when his father died, Joseph asked permission of Pharaoh to take his father back to the land of Canaan and bury him. This is the longest funeral procession ever in the history of the world, probably. It was a long way from Egypt to Canaan. But this funeral procession was massive. All the servants and all of the people, I mean, it was the family of, of um, Jacob, the whole tribe, they all went up to Canaan to bury their father. <laughs> it was huge. And all the Canaanites saw this happen. All the Canaanites watched as Joseph and his entourage, this Egyptian ruler, brings his father and buries him in the cave of Machpelah. It's an interesting story, isn't it? But God has taught us something by this story. In fact, he's taught us a number of things. With every crucifixion, there's always a resurrection. God knows that we have to we have to be cleansed of our sin. So God organizes and orchestrates circumstances so that we may come face to face with it and get it out. Reconciliation is a powerful bonding tool in the hand of God. When we have sinned against one another, when we reconcile, it happens that God brings us closer together. Have you ever had anyone confess a sin to you? I have. In fact, not long ago. I called up an acquaintance of mine to do me a favor. And he agreed to do the favor. That was no problem. But then he said, I want to talk to you. This is on the phone. He said, I have said some things about you that I realized were wrong. I had no idea that he'd said these things. But he confessed it. He humbled himself. And he confessed his sin. And of course, I forgave him. <laughs> but now we are good friends again. I, I, I knew that there was some strain between us. I didn't know what it was. I had no idea. But I thought very big of him to make the confession. And I appreciate so much. Now I know that I can rely on him as a friend, not just as an acquaintance, but as a friend. Friends, if you have something that you have in your life that you have done to someone else, don't hesitate to confess it. Don't hesitate to give it up. Let God take it. Go to them privately. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> Go to them privately. Talk to them. Explain to them. Let, humble yourself. The greatest difficulty the human being has to deal with is pride. It's the hardest thing. But God calls us brothers and sisters in these last days to be like Joseph's brothers. To confess. Resolve alienation. Find a way to, to, to humble yourself and let go of anything that stands between you and somebody else. This is God's plan for his people to prepare them for the kingdom of heaven. You'll never be ready unless you do. Don't worry about slights, backstabbing, injustice. Those things are for our own benefit. It's the sin that we should worry about. The sin in our own lives. The thing that alienates us from God. God wants to restore us to himself. The story of Joseph tells us how to do this. And how God does it. He works in our lives to create circumstances that we cannot avoid. And if we choose to, he can use them to restore confidence and faith between brothers and sisters in God's church. So chapter 37 is about the church. 
Chapter 39 is about the world, how Joseph related to the church and how Joseph related to the world. But chapter 40. Four and 45 are about reconciliation within the church once again. So it goes from the church to the world back to the church. And in the end, the church, Jacob's and his sons and their families, they unite together once again in the land of Egypt. Even though they're in the world, they are, in, they are a church united there in that great land. And you can think about how their influence must have been. Joseph's the ruler in Egypt, and these brothers are, are there at his behest. And when their father dies, they're worried that now Joseph will take revenge on him. And he tells them, don't worry. Be at peace. I have no problem with any of you. Friends, I believe God calls us to experience humility and reconciliation one with another. And we learn this from the life of Joseph. God bless you.